Today we've got a great revenge story of ruining a school's pristine record. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, boss chiseled me out of $100 and paid the price. I'm a contractor. While working on a project in a very remote location, I arranged to buy and bring two rounds of breakfast tacos for the staff of the county facility where I would be working for the next week in exchange for free copy privileges. The boss gave approval on the phone and the total for the tacos that week came out to just over $100. A great exchange as the copy budget was upwards of $1,000. My receipts along with the supporting CC statement I submitted at the end of the billing cycle between a week and two weeks after he'd verbally approved the expense was declined. I wasn't too angry but a deal's a deal and I called the boss to remind him he'd approved the expense. His response, you should have gotten it in writing. Ticked me off royally but I finished the project as promised and was working on another project for another client less than a week later. A couple of months go by and the boss who'd chiseled me out of the money called to see if I was available to work on another project beginning on the first of the next month and after some haggling I agreed. The work schedule would be tight and in his words this was an all hands on deck project with nights and weekends expected. I was also told that this was a new client and they wanted to impress. A couple of days before the project was set to begin, the chiseler called to tell me the engagement paperwork was on the way and check my email. I told him I had decided not to work on the project after all and he was furious. He screamed, I mean screamed, you agreed to work on this project weeks ago. I repeated his words verbatim, you should have gotten it in writing. I mean, as soon as you work with somebody who hits you with a, you should have gotten it in writing, that is immediately grounds to never work with a person like that again. Like, I get having buddy-buddy deals or having deals with friends that are all completely verbal, but the second anything like this goes down, honestly, it probably doesn't stop people from just not working with that person again. It probably changes that person from ever doing stuff like that again regardless. Me and Cornwall commented, had a director do a verbal contracts aren't worth the paper they're written on regarding back pay on a contract change. I agreed with him and immediately cancelled all my shifts as I was no longer under any contractual obligation. Told them if they decided to rethink their attitude regarding verbal contracts to call me. They called. Sometimes when they think they hold all the power, it's good to remind them they have nothing without workers. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you guys enjoy awesome stories of revenge, it would be amazing if you left a like or left a review if you're listening to my podcast. That said, our next story is, I demand you to stay at work. Many years ago, I worked caring for challenging youngsters on the autistic spectrum. Staffing was an issue, it resulted in not enough staff and underqualified staff. I was approaching my shift end and was aware we didn't have sufficient staff for the evening, so called the on-call manager to deal with it. Now, on-call manager is a crappy job, she won't be able to find staff and will most likely have to do the shift herself. She was determined not to, so ordered me to stay, she claimed I had a legal duty. I pointed out my legal duty doesn't extend outside my contracted hours. This shift is not in my contracted hours. She decided to stand her ground so I couldn't resist freaking with her, so I told her, I have responsibilities at home too, you know. I have a 5 and a 7 year old at home who have had no one caring for them since 8am. Do you really think it's ethical to leave them for longer? I refused to enter further debate and told her I was leaving now. I was still laughing at the mess of paperwork my child abuse admission will have created when my phone rang. Director of Child Services says, Hi mate. I reply, Hi bud. The director replies, It's your dogs, isn't it? I reply, Yes mate. The director says, I take it she was being a jerk. I said, Very much. The director replies, Cheers then. I'd love to have seen her face. Honestly, I'm impressed that they didn't have to, like, do some kind of scheduled checkup anyways. I mean, I don't know, I guess they should have records as to whether or not the person you're speaking to actually does have any children or not. Although, to be fair, in general, does child services ever actually just call? SG Waba commented, Not only did you have underqualified staff as colleagues, but you were burdened with underqualified management as well. Our next story is, Entitled Man Refused to Wait in Line at the Pharmacy and Got What He Deserved. This is a story my friend told me that I thought fit in this sub nicely. A man walked into her pharmacy at 8.30, about 30 minutes before they closed for the day. There was a bit of a line inside and the drive-thru was backed up. 
Now, instead of getting me in the back of the line like a normal person, he walked straight up to the counter and started saying that the pharmacy down the street sent him here and demanded that she fill his script before they close for the night. The pharmacist is annoyed but is polite, found his script in the computer, and said if he gets in the pickup line, it'll be ready by the time he gets to the front. The man insisted he doesn't need to wait in line and went to stand off to the side with his arms crossed like a jerk. It had already been a long day shift with a never-ending stream of annoying customers, so the pharmacist was fed up by this point. His script was only a package that needed a label slapped on it and to be put into a bag, so it was ready in two minutes. But instead of calling him over, she let it sit there. She let him stand there for about 15 minutes before she paged him over the PA and checked him out. Moral of the story, it costs nothing to be nice, but it costs about 15 minutes to be a jerk. I was hoping OP was going to say like there was a mad rush of people that joined in line and they made them wait for the whole line or something. Either way, I'm assuming they more than covered the rest of the line in those 15 minutes. I mean, obviously this guy should have just done that from the start. MalibuCat48 commented, Talk about trying to save time and making it worse. This is not my revenge, but karma doing it. In Los Angeles on the 405 freeway at rush hour, it is always bumper to bumper, barely moving. A fancy Corvette decided to drive on the shoulder to get around the traffic. A few minutes later, I saw him stopped on the shoulder with a flat tire because he drove over debris on the side. So instead of saving 5 or 10 minutes in traffic, he'll wait 2 hours for a tow truck and have to spend a lot of money on a new tire for his expensive car. Sometimes the universe just knows. TA to tell or not to tell commented, The other day somebody tried to go around me on the shoulder and then joined into the incoming entrance ramp. Didn't make it far because it was very backed up. Tried to get into my lane in front of me but I wouldn't let them, so they ended up exactly where they started, right behind me. Our next story is, let your dogs bark? Me too then. Been unemployed for almost a year. A lot of my neighbors have dogs and the majority just let them bark outside. Our houses are all detached, but they're basically sardined together, a couple of meters of space between each house, so this gets annoying fast. I've finally got a job, but coming home mentally tired and having to deal with non-stop barking is starting to send me over the edge, so now when I hear a dog bark, I've started barking back at them. If you can't beat them, join them. It might be a placebo, but I've started this tonight and the effect is almost immediate. Suddenly, the barking isn't constant, just once every few minutes, and as soon as I jump in and join the fun, it magically gets quiet. I'll be the crazy neighbor now, I don't give a freak. I'm ready for someone to come by and tell me to stop, because my response will be, when y'all stop, I'll stop. The weirdest of wins, but I'm ready to pull what little hair I have, so freak it. I mean, I like this revenge, but I just know if I tried to apply this kind of thing in my life, the dog probably wouldn't just keep barking back at me, it would probably make the dog more enraged and just go longer. Like, it would be almost like rewarding the dog for barking, giving them a treat. Here's something actually to keep barking at. Minimum award for you commented, I would record myself barking and play it on loop, maybe toss in a high-pitched dog whistle at random times, but I'm petty like that. Our next story is, I didn't quit just to make her mad. This is very mild compared to some stories, but for some reason this is on my mind today. Many years ago, I started working at this behavioral health facility. The setup consisted of a large room with desks for each case manager. We could hear everyone else's calls, etc. My first day, I walk in all young, precious, and ready to learn the job. This lady, picture the smallest woman you've ever seen, calls her friend at another desk right in front of me and said, I give her three months tops. And then both of them cracked up laughing. I've stayed there for two years wanting to quit every single day. It was hands down the worst job I've ever had. But I waited for her to leave first. On her last day I said, so I guess I lasted longer than three months. She turned white and tried to act like she had no idea what I was referring to. I quit a week after she left. I'm sure she found out because her mother, sweet woman, worked there too. It still gives me satisfaction to this day and that was more than 15 years ago. I don't know if OP truly won here in this revenge story. They said they stayed here for two years wanting to quit every single day. If you want to wear the crown of being petty, I think you're a candidate. Carer3is commented, that's some serious persistence. I wonder how often she played that game with her friend that she'd have such a horrified reaction. 
Ready Competition 66 commented, I'm sure she said that about every person who started there. It's unlikely she remembered specifically saying that about OP, but yeah, getting her own words dished up to her must have really ticked her off. Our next story is, Insult My Wife. I once had a fallout with my roommate and longtime friend. After he left, I still needed for him to take his name off a truck title. I agreed to meet him at a bank because they had a notary. When I was waiting on another party to arrive, I had to bite my tongue and listen to him badmouth my wife. Eventually, I had enough and snapped back. He decided to leave without signing the title. I literally put my foot down behind his SUV and told him we are doing this so we can part ways and be done. He ran over my foot. I screamed like it hurt me, but it didn't. When he got out to check it out, I went around to the driver's side, snagged the keys out of his ignition, and tossed them on the roof of the bank. He had to wait for security to arrive, making him late for an appointment. I never did get his name off of the title. The best part was when I told my wife about what happened. We had the best hookup ever. She was really motivated for standing up for her. Well, I'm glad it worked out in at least one way for OP, cause it sure as heck didn't work out of that title. Stink more chill for you commented, I don't know how many times I stood up for my now ex-wife. I defend her to the neighbors, friends, my family, her family, and employees, just to find out everything was true. Everything was much worse. Our next story is, Jerk Dad Hits My Daughter In Face With Frisbee. Background, many years ago when my daughter, MD, was six, we went to a dad-daughter activity at her school. MD had recently lost her two front top baby teeth and permanent teeth were just breaking through. This will be relevant in the story. One of the dads, who was and probably still is a bit of a know-it-all jerk, JD for jerky dad, was attending with his two daughters, one in MD's grade and an older 10-year-old. JD decided to teach his 10-year-old daughter how to throw a frisbee. He did this while standing in the middle of the crowd of about 80 people. And this wasn't just any regular frisbee, it was the heavier and larger competition frisbees. JD wanted us all to know that he was on an ultimate frisbee team and that his skills were amazing in his own mind. Well, one of his errant throws hooked hard to the right and caught MD square in her mouth, knocking her off her feet. I ran to MD and picked her up, getting blood from her busted lip, very minor injury all over my shirt. The blood made the minor injury look much worse than it actually was. A crowd gathered to see what had happened. JD came up and said that MD had walked into the throw. I let him know that I'd seen the whole thing and that he was trying to throw it to his older daughter who was standing about 30 feet to the right of us. I asked JD why he thought it was a good idea to throw that frisbee in the middle of a crowded area since he didn't have the skills to control it. And of course, he had nothing worthwhile to say. Here's the petty revenge. I whispered in my daughter's ear to play along. Then I made a big show of examining my still sobbing daughter's lip. With many still gathered, the conversation went like this. It looks like you knocked out our two front teeth? JD said, oh my god, I'm so sorry. Did I really knock them out? MD, right on cue, looked at JD and sobbed out a pathetic, yes. And then she showed JD the gap in her teeth. She immediately buried her face in my shoulder again, except this time she was only pretending to sob in order to mask her laughing. By the way, MD is an adult now and is still just as devious. I saw JD again for the middle school graduation. He commented on the frisbee incident, which I had just about forgotten. Now it was my turn. I said, do you see she's got braces? You knocked out her baby teeth. Her orthodontist said without them in place, the permanent teeth didn't have a guide to follow and they came in really crooked. That, of course, was all nonsense that I made up on the spot. JD was once again speechless. MD is now an adult and her teeth are perfect. JD is probably still a jerk. I know I already said that above, but it feels so good to say it again. Honestly, to be fair, it's for the best that she didn't have teeth there. I imagine an incident like that could very well be enough to even just at least like chip a tooth. I mean, how many stories do you hear of somebody who just takes a stumble, hits their mouth on something and bam, chip tooth just like that. Mamble Pamble commented, My front tooth is fake and when I was in high school I had a flipper, a retainer with a tooth on it. One time, my friends and I were horsing around and I got elbowed in the upper lip slash nose. My friend wasn't very apologetic, so I covered my face, spat out my flipper, and grimaced and asked, How does it look? He'd forgotten about my fake tooth. He cried. Our next story is Petty Revenge on the Neighborhood Lawn Police. 
My husband, 53-year-old male, and I, 52-year-old female, bought our first house 13 years ago and quickly realized we were the black sheep of the neighborhood. We were in a quiet cul-de-sac in the middle of town, a neighborhood we never really knew existed until we started looking for homes to buy. Our neighbors are about 10 to 20 years older than us and keep their yards to an unsustainable perfection unless you either hire a lawn service or are retired and have nothing better to do than yard work 24-7, rain or shine. The neighbors to our sides and across the street are the latter. One neighbor will use a leaf vacuum to remove leaves from his yard in the street in front of his house multiple times a day. If it's storming, he'll stand in his garage with the door open and will rush out during breaks in the rain to remove every last leaf. Dude has serious OCD about his lawn. He doesn't own one tree and benches to the other neighbors about the sycamore tree in our front yard because it not only peels its bark year round but also drops its leaves really early into the season. We don't rake our leaves because it's a great natural fertilizer, but we do pick up large branches and bark before we mow. Not long after we purchased the house, I became disabled and could no longer do heavy yard work. My husband kept it up until he became disabled during the pandemic and couldn't do the heavy lifting either. We now have very limited funds, so we hired a kid to mow and whatnot for us very cheap. When the school stopped online classes once the pandemic was under control, he stopped working, and we had to rely on family to help. They are only able to help a couple times a month at the most, and this is apparently unacceptable to our neighbors. If our grass is a smidge over 6 inches, they call the city code enforcement office and report us. I've gotten to know the woman fielding the calls very well over the past couple years. She agrees that the reports are excessive, but is still required to follow up and contact us about the complaints. Many of their complaints are a civil issue, such as tree too close to a fence, but grass height is the one that we have to abide. If we've had a good rain, like this year it rained a lot, then sure, our lawn is going to grow faster and our family may not be able to come into town immediately and help. They have never once spoken to us about it, never once asked why the sudden change in lawn care. In fact, we've never even spoke to any of the problem neighbors in over five years. Instead, they report us and report us and report us. Again, the city understands and gives us a month to get it taken care of. And we do. Every time. It's absolutely ridiculous. So one day, we decided that we were done with trying to be a nice neighbor and fit in with the golf course lawn crowd, so we got petty. We called the city to get the property line tagged and asked for a copy of the city code about what you can and can't put on your lawn. Pink flamingos are not on that list. We now have 20 large pink flamingos a few inches on our side of the property line and along our side of the sidewalk. There's not a dang thing they can do about it and it most definitely gave the city official a good laugh. We still gotta keep the grass under 6 inches, but it just feels different now. That whole experience sounds like an utter nightmare. I imagine if I were in that situation, I would just start to like resort to fixing it on near the last day. Just make them suffer for as long as possible and then make sure you take care of it still within the time limit. Maintenance Slave 514 commented, Somebody continually calls the city whenever I work on my house? To date, I have had 12 stop work orders, 10 of which are for non-permit required issues. Ripped up my yard, found out what native plants attract butterflies, planted them, and got my yard certified as a sanctuary for the butterflies. City showed up once, gave them the state cert and copy of the state rules. They've only been back once. Still that neighbor, but I now have pretty butterflies in my yard. That makes me happy. Our next story is ruining a school record. Just before my senior year of high school, my father moved me to Louisiana. There, I had an encounter with a principal who wouldn't take one of my credits from my old school because their classes were different. He also accused me of lying about getting a water from the vending machine, which was for a teacher and wasn't breaking any school rules. I posted about this story in another post and a few people asked about my other encounters I mentioned. It's on my profile if you're interested, so this might be considered part two. Late in the school year, I was really not liking the school much due to previous encounters, missing all my friends, disliking humidity, and many more reasons. I found out for graduation they charged $240 for cap and gown and a walk at graduation. My dad offered to pay but it seemed terribly expensive and I didn't want to do it on principle. This was in 2001, to put that in perspective. 
Also, no outside pictures. You had to buy their pictures for $40, which they would snap if you paid. This is before cell phones with cameras were common, in the dinosaur days. So I decided not to pay and not to go. Later that month, April, I get a call to the principal's office. I am one of 10 kids called and we already don't like each other from past instances. He tells us it's because we haven't paid for graduation. I was one of the last kids in the line of seniors he was talking to. Everyone else had either had the check and just hadn't turned it in or were getting the money because their family was low income. When the principal gets to me, I tell them I'm not going and I don't intend to pay. His response was to say that I had to go. I again told him I wasn't paying and it was crazy expensive. He tells me that no kid has ever not walked for graduation in his school. It's a school record. I don't know if it was true, but I believe it because it was something kids were proud of in this town. Not me, since I disliked him and the school. I tell him I will walk if he gives me the cap and gown for free. He says he's not going to do that because then other kids would want it. Well, I'm not going then, and he can't make me give him the money, so stalemate. The other students are mortified because everyone is afraid of this jerk. I have straight A's because the classes are so easy in the school and most are reteaching stuff I learned 10th or 11th grade in California, so I get kicked out of his office. The principal called my father about this and I told my dad he could just say since I didn't go to the school for all three years, 10 to 12 in this school, and my credits aren't all valid, I guess I'm not a real student so it wouldn't ruin their record. My dad is kind of petty too, so he said something like that. No one else called us again about it. Graduation comes and goes without me there. The petty revenge comes in when they have to mail me my diploma because I didn't go, which I made them do and called the school till I got it. According to the principal, it was the first time they ever had to do that. Sadly, it's not even my last encounter in that school. That's another story for another day though. You know, I never really realized how much of a racket graduation is. If anybody hearing this is in a situation where you haven't graduated yet, if you have an option to rent the cap or gown, opt for that. It doesn't matter how sentimental you feel like you might be about it, you don't do anything with the cap and gown after you're done. I purchased mine for high school, and once it was done, it went in the closet, and that's it, that's that's all. It's not even like really tied to the experience of high school because you wore it for one night at the very end. I don't think there was ever a moment where I walked past the closet, saw the gown hanging in there and went, yeah, I did it. I just think, wow, I paid like 65 bucks for nothing. Sick Monkey 3 commented, the high school I graduated from bought 250 gowns with school colors, black with red and gray trim. When they finally built the school in 2011, all you pay for is the cap and tassel because you keep it and it was like $20 combined? Then again, the parents of the students where I lived were the ones who paid for the school to be built in the first place. That sounds like a kickback situation with the school you went to. Our next story is, got a debt collector for a furniture store off my back. This post started as a comment on another subreddit, but I realized that it might make a good post here. The credit reporting companies are notorious for conflating and transposing social security number, addresses, and other info between accounts of different people. Had to deal with this pain in the butt issue with an old roommate who scammed a bunch of creditors and then disappeared. The debt collectors for a local furniture company decided that, since I was a woman who lived at the same address, I must be the same person as my old roommate. Got so bad that I had to pay a visit to the furniture company that roommates stole from and speak to the owner told them that if I had one more debt collector try to pursue me for my roommate's debt, I'd sue him for libel. I'd be happy to share any info that turned up, as roommate had stiffed me a couple months rent and bills. I'd love to see the debt collectors pursue her to the bowels of heck, but I went online and purchased a similar domain name to his, myfurniturestore.net, and told him if I had to spend any more time on his crap, I would be posting on my new website all about the legal case I would file about his attempts to defame me. This quickly put an end to the matter. I almost feel like at that point it's out of the owner's hands. Like once it's to the debt collectors, they don't give a crap, they got one MO and that is to get some money. Tired of usernames11 commented, The previous tenant of an apartment I lived in was apparently a doozy of a person. 
I had debt collectors showing up, tons of law enforcement showing during warrant, roundup days, etc. She had a distinctly ethic name that most decidedly did not match up with my appearance. So the law enforcement folks very quickly and easily were convinced that she and I were not one and the same, though after the third agency showed that day, I did beg them to somehow communicate with each other that she no longer resided at that address. The rent-to-own place? Whole different story. Those people nearly forced their way into my apartment to try to repossess furniture and stuff I did not have. Only me being on 911 dispatch finally got them to back off and believe I wasn't who they were looking for. Then they stupidly asked me if I knew her new address. Because I'm so likely to know anything about the prior tenant? I'm still angry about how unsafe they made me feel that day. Our next story is, gave a speech about my success in front of my ex. My ex treated me poorly, but not abusive or anything that extreme. He just expected me to absorb the worst and angriest parts of him quietly and didn't really get to know me as a person. Also, he broke up with me on a major holiday right after I'd learned I'd had a miscarriage with him. He ghosted me even after I told him this. Class act, obviously. He also basically told me I didn't deserve to be successful and that I wasn't a real person. He tried to make me feel uncomfortable in a space where I arrived first and he came in a year later, openly mocked me with friends in the club when I won an award for my hard work, just stupid behavior. Well joke on him because I became an overnight success story in our field. Now jobs are lining up asking me to be a part of their projects and he's still trying to get people to like him because he's so obtuse it's painful to talk to him sometimes. I even was offered the chance to come back as an alumni of the club to come and speak specifically about my success with photo evidence of the big names I was working with. I arrived in a hot professor outfit and he came late looking like a rejected loser frat boy, which was the total opposite of how he used to dress. He looked surprised to see me sitting with the club's top brass as he always wanted to be friends with them and I actually did it. He sat in the last row and had to watch me describe the hard work I put into my success and how it bred even more wins for me because of how I move in the industry. His face when I revealed who I worked with was priceless. The room gave out a collective gasp at well at the info and he was turning bright red and fuming in the back of the room. He loved the work this person had done and had wanted to work with them one day and I had beat him to the punch by a freaking marathon, not just a mile. Best part was that I got to explain networking and made it extremely clear that people who do freak around in and out of work around coworkers will absolutely find out the hard way when they don't get jobs. It applied to him and a few others from the club who I didn't make eye contact with. But my crew who was in the meeting knew exactly why I didn't want him on because he would have been extremely unprofessional with me as his boss. I wouldn't have minded working together, but he has no class or decorum and it would have ruined the project for everyone. When the meeting semi ended, I stayed with my friends at the front of the room talking and laughing and I could see him in the corner of my eye talking around the edge of the space, not sure if he would be accepted. His biggest fear is that people won't like him, and God, watching me being surrounded and shown so much love and appreciation right in front of him, I just know it sent him into a tailspin because he walked out in an absolute huff. Even the people who took his side of the breakup and aided in making fun of me with him at our special event where I was awarded are now sidling up to me and were choosing to treat me as more important than him because of my work. Success in a life well lived really is the best petty revenge I'll ever need. Edit for clarity, my ex did the making fun of me at work event after we had broken up. He rallied people to his side to make fun of my award after we were over. He called me a bad person who didn't deserve anything when we broke up. Truly, I was not being abused as hard as you all lovely people think I was or was not. He was a jerk completely, but we're in our early 20s, so please don't be too harsh on either of us. He had never been in a relationship before me, and I should have broken up with him as soon as he started acting out and taking his stress out on me. Also, my hot professor outfit was corduroy pants, a collared button-up which was partially unbuttoned to a nice undershirt with layered necklaces, some pretty rings, and sensible heels. If you'd like to make fun of something about me, get your mind out of the gutter before doing it. I'm not the one. To anyone who says this is fake, girl, if you don't take a walk around the neighborhood and get some fresh air. I work in film and media with artists, so yeah, they're vocal and outspoken. 
and reaching up as high as I did with my new colleagues, of course they gasped. I would have said some crap too if it hadn't been me who lived it myself. We're all in film for a reason. We love having a flair for the dramatics at many points in our lives. Additional edit, thank you truly to everyone who commented and were genuinely curious to know if I was okay, and to point out he was being abusive to me. The relationship was very short-lived, so I wasn't slowly suffering a great pain. Very hard-hitting sucker punches? Absolutely. And my family is actually more supportive of me than I always feel worthy of. My dad is the epitome of a true girl dad and is shown by example in how he treats my mother, sister, and everyone he knows as how a male partner should behave. My very first relationship ever, not this one, was filled with outside trauma that happened to us that made our connection toxic and very abusive. It's made finding partners that are good and solid people hard but I'm always working on it and myself to try to heal those wounds so I don't spread it to others. Thank you all again for your kindness. Yeah, I think it goes without saying and OP addressed it in the edits, but really I think OP is extremely almost forgiveful and downplaying of the way their partner treated them because I just definitely wouldn't classify it the way OP did. I definitely wouldn't be the one pleading to strangers on Reddit to take it easy on him because he's younger. Sufficient Nobody 72 echoed this commenting, not abusive or anything, proceeds to mention many instances of emotional abuse. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.